It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Mr. Fl Frank Clark, but this honor really should go to Thomas Jefferson, AKA Bill Barker, who actually worked with Frank Clark for decades at Williamsburg. But um, here I am uh, doing the job that, uh, that Bill would do so much better. But anyway, um, we are lucky to have Frank here this evening especially because he is celebrating his 20th wedding anniversary. So shout out to Frank and his wife. Gail, are you here? Are you here? Just, there she is. Best wishes to you, Gail. Thank you. Um, so Frank has been at Williamsburg for 34 years. And he probably has been wearing funny clothes for all of those 34 years. But for 29 years, he's been in the Department of Historic Foodways, which is a noted research center about the history of food in early America. So it's a serious outfit down there. And Frank is a local boy. That's to say that he went to Lafayette High School in Williamsburg, which you've all passed on your way into the Berg. And he went to Ferrum College, where he studied philosophy. What I want to know, Frank, is how you got from philosophy to beer. <laughs> yeah, uh, OK, so there's the answer. So um, Frank's primary area of research is 18th century cooking, and you might have encountered him at CW in the Palace Kitchen. I know that I have, but he was wearing, he wears different clothes in the kitchen. He's dressed up tonight. Um, and he's also been a specialist, obviously, in beer br brewing. He created the program that's called The Arts and Mysteries of Brew Brewing at Williamsburg, and he's the author of two chapters in the book, Chocolate, History, Heritage, and Culture. And this um, validates our taste and appetite for chocolate in the early era. He's also worked with Aleworks Brewing Company to create a line of beers exclusively brewed for CW based on 18th century brewing recipes so that you can taste the authentic taste. He has studied historic chocolate making and butchering. I'm not sure how these are connected exactly. <laughs> Anything with food. And he worked with the Mars Co Corporation to help develop a historic chocolate brand called American Heritage. And I personally have tasted this and can vouch for it. It's great. And more recently, he worked with historic area products at Williamsburg to create some historically inspired condiments, mustard, and ke what I call ketchup, an 1830s ketchup, so a little later than our period. Um, Frank is a media personality. He's given numerous print interviews and historic and food and beer on his topics. And he's appeared on the Food Network on shows called Dinner Impossible and Unwrapped, and you probably will recognize him from the very popular A Taste of History series. Um, recently, he was featured in the film called Beers of Joy, and the show, uh, and the show, uh, and the show State Plates with Tyler Hicks. Mr. Clark has been a speaker at the Associates, Association of Home Brewers Conference three times, and he created and hosted the first Ale Through the Ages conference in 2014 and the second Ales conference last year. Um, he also serves on the board of directors on an, a museum that I only just learned about, and it is the Virginia Beer Museum, which has to be on our next itin travel itinerary. And it's a nonprofit that's devoted to preserving and interpreting Virginia's role in the history of beer and brewing. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Clark. Thank you so much, Susan.
Welcome. I'm, I'm so excited to be here. This is such a neat place. Uh, I was lucky enough to get a wonderful tour from uh, Punky yesterday uh, to see all the, the details of this house and, and this building. And it was just so impressive. And I'm, I'm very, very honored to be speaking with you all uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about beer, a little bit about Thomas Jefferson, uh, a little bit about Joseph Miller. Uh, I want to thank uh, Punky for explaining that connection. I never could quite figure out uh, the connection that uh, we had with, with Mr. Miller. Uh, but it, it's so neat to, uh, to be able to speak with you guys here uh, about one of my very favorite subjects. Now, normally when we think of Mr. Jefferson, we think of French wine. I know that is really the, the, his probably big preference, uh, although he was a, a big fan of, of many fermented beverages. He drank cider, uh, he also drank small beer, uh, an occasional uh, porter as well, uh, but probably best known for his love of French wine. But uh, Jefferson was also very concerned with being uh, efficient and, and, and being able to uh, get things he needed from his home household and own estate. And I think that's what turned him uh, towards making beer uh, early on, or after he retires really from the presidency, goes back to uh, uh, Monticello and, and, and begins to, to sort of look at, at doing more farming uh, there on the property and, and getting all those sorts of things going. And, and also begins to look at um, the possibility of brewing at Monticello. We're going to put up a long quote here. I'm not going to bother reading through it. I'll, I'll let you guys do that. But uh, this is a, a very interesting uh, letter that Jefferson writes uh, and, and talks about his brewing here uh, and a little bit about the history of how he ended up starting uh, brewing here. Uh, and so uh, it, is, it is Mr. Miller, who Captain Miller, who was responsible for training uh, Mr. Hemmings in the skill of, of brewing. Um, there are a couple of interesting things we can draw about, conclusions we can draw about the beer uh, from this statement as well. He is taking eight gallons only from a bushel of wheat. Uh, first off, that tells us he's brewing with wheat, which is not the most common ingredient used in brewing at this time. Uh, more common to see barley, uh, but there are a fair amount of, of wheat beers uh, being brewed here in Virginia because it grows better here, really, than barley does. Uh, and we know that Landon Carter down on the Northern Neck uh, is brewing with wheat uh, as well as Mr. Jefferson here. Uh, and, and that seems to be a very common substitute here in the South as, as it's not particularly good barley growing country. Uh, and so it is also telling us that he's making a fairly strong and alcoholic uh, version uh, of this liquor uh, by, by telling us how much liquid he is taking from that bushel of wheat. Uh, that tells us the, the strength. Uh, he also complains about the public brewers who take 15 barrels from their uh, bushel of wheat, uh, which makes their liquor meager and often vapid. Uh, you gotta love the 18th century language. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that he's telling us in this, and we're gonna sort of take a minute to unpack this statement a little bit uh, and, and get into some of the, the details that he's providing for us in uh, this discussion. As I was saying, he, he returns after his presidency and, and really starts to concentrate on running the property. There are probably some financial factors uh, involved in this. Mr. Jefferson uh, never being the best manager of money of uh, anyone in the 18th century. Uh, and I think he was in, in need of trying to, to refine his, his finances a bit. Uh, and he began to explore the process of, of brewing uh, around 1813. Uh, he seems to really take more and more interest in it. Uh, and in typical Jefferson fashion, uh, he likes to start off in uh, things by, by reading. Uh, and he had two books in his collection uh, that were 18th century brewing books and manuals uh, that he uh, was interested in, in using uh, to help further his. Uh, he was a big fan of, of this book by uh, the, the theory and practice of brewing, because this was an early attempt uh, to put scientific reason to a, a trade which was more of an art and mystery than a science in this period. 
Uh, as, as we go through brewing in the 18th century, there's a lot of technological changes that are going to really improve the process. We'll talk about some of those today as, as we go through this. Uh, but there's also a much better understanding of science that is starting to develop. Uh, and I think uh, Combrine is, is, is kind of interested in, in, in converting brewing into a science. Uh, the only problem is his science is pretty bad. Uh, There's not a lot of, of really um, scientific principles involved. At, at one point he describes yeast as being composed of equal amounts of earth and fire. So uh, there are some, uh, some issues with uh, his science, but uh, at least he's trying. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, and, and as science improves throughout the period, he's going to really get a much better understanding of that. Uh, the other book uh, that, that Jefferson refers to is The London and Country Brewer by Mr. Ellis, William Ellis. Uh, and I, I use that book frequently uh, in our brewing program at Colonial Williamsburg because he has some really good sort of, I like to call them early proto-porter recipes. Porter is a style of beer that's actually developed in the 18th century. It's born sometime around 1710, 1715 in London uh, and uh, is, is starting to take over uh, the brewing industry in, in a number of ways as, as we'll see as we go a little further uh, through the process. So Jefferson wants to start off with, with the reading uh, and, and becomes to the realization that brewing is, is not as easy to nail down uh, a process as writing a recipe for, for cooking, perhaps, uh, might be. Uh, and, and this is a great quote from him uh, about the value of, of Combrine's book, but also about uh, uh, the, the difficulty of nailing down some of these processes uh, into particular recipes of the period. So as he's beginning to explore working with Mr. Captain Miller about uh, brewing at Monticello, uh, he's looking for his books back to, to get some more science, I guess, for Mr. Combrine uh, to help him understand that process a little bit better uh, and the beginning of the stages of all this. Uh, Miller, as, as Punky mentioned, was, was a ship's captain, uh, but he also had managed to spend four years in a London brewery uh, and picked up the trade of brewing uh, in between his, his time at sea, uh, he had done some, uh, a brief stint of brewing in, in a London uh, brewery, and, and that's kind of where uh, his skills must have, have come from. As Jefferson describes him in a letter to someone else, he took to the seafaring business, which, which he has followed all his life, except for four years he spent when engaged in a, in a brewing. Uh, so that was uh, sort of the background that, that Jefferson provided uh, for uh, someone else to, to describe his skills. We're first going to describe the process of brewing and how beer is made, at least in the 18th century, in pretty much the same way today. Uh, we can be a little cleaner, a little quicker, we have better temperature control, uh, but, but the basic process of making beer it, is still pretty much the same. Actually, in the 18th century, we would generally refer to this liquid as a malt liquor. Now, today, that's not what we think of as it's a very particular style of beer. Uh, but in the 18th century, they're all malt liquors because they are the liquor of malt grains. Uh, we take that term liquor very differently 200 years ago. Today, if I say liquor, you guys automatically think, you know, schnapps. Uh, bourbon, uh, what have you. Uh, but in the 18th century, liquor is used to indicate any liquid of any type. Uh, so cookbooks will tell us to take the liquor of a chicken and do something with it, uh, or, or the, uh, uh, the liquor of your broth uh, that will become uh, reduced down to become a sauce, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, so we have hot liquors in the 18th century. Any guess as to what the hot liquors are? Tea, coffee, chocolate. They are the hot liquors because they are liquors you drink hot. This is actually a very big change for the English. In the uh, period prior to that, it was not considered healthy to drink anything warmer than blood or milk from a cow. 
Uh, so uh, the idea of, of putting boiling hot liquids in your mouth took a, took a little while to get adjusted to uh, in England. Uh, and so they became referred to as the hot liquors. There were also the spiritus liquors. Now those are what we think of as liquor today. Uh, but the malt liquors are liquors that come from malt. And malt is a process of, of getting more sugar or, or really converting the proteins and grains into simple sugars that can be eaten by yeast. So we're gonna look at uh, this a little bit more detail to, to understand uh, some of the process here. Oops, I'm going the wrong way, sorry. So malt is a grain that has been soaked and sprouted. Typically, the 18th century uh, brewing manuals tell you to uh, soak it for three days in liquid and then throw it down on a brick floor and spread it all very thin. And after about a week or so, it'll begin to sprout. Um, any of you gardeners out there who know, uh, who started their own seeds, uh, know what we're talking about. It's hard to tell in, in, in a large screen here, but there are tiny little hairs, uh, rootlets, in fact, that are sprouting out of the grain there uh, that are indicating that we have just begun to start to convert those proteins over into simple sugars. So what we have to do at this point is stop it or otherwise we'll have barley plants if it just keeps growing away. So what we'll do is take that grain, gather it all up and put it into a kiln. Uh, these kilns were often uh, done with a horsehair sieved on the top that the grain rested on and then a wood fire or coal fire uh, below. As the English get better at making beer during the 18th century uh, and start to improve this process, they start to get rid of the, the wood fires because the wood fires often have the effect of making the beer taste like smoke. Uh, whereas the coal or coke that they're using later in the 18th century burns very clean and does not flavor the grain as it roasts in that, uh, in that malt kiln. So the longer that grain stays in the kiln, the higher the temperature is in the kiln, the darker the grain will become. The color of your beer comes from the color of the grain that you put in it. So if you want to make Bud Light, you need your grain toasted very lightly at a very low temperature for a relatively short period of time. Uh, that's also gonna preserve lots and lots of sugars by doing that process uh, that makes the malt even more uh, concentrated or, or powerful. Uh, if you wanna make Guinness Stout or a dark beer, you're gonna need to roast at least some of that grain very dark in color. Uh, and in fact, in 1817, uh, a, a fellow named Wheeler over in England came up with a patented drum that allowed him to actually create really dark malts. Because normally if you're starting to heat that grain up on those, of those fires uh, to a really high temperature, it starts to explode, just like popcorn. In fact, they referred to the early porter malt as blown malt because it blew up uh, in the kiln. Uh, and in some cases it did. Uh, kiln fires are very common uh, in 18th century malt houses, which is uh, somewhat of a problem as well. Uh, and, and Wheeler's uh, solution is ingenious. Inside his metal drum, he has little uh, spouts for water. And so as the grain begins to heat up to the point where it's about to explode, he sprays a little water in there. And that cools it down and keeps it from uh, blowing up like that and allows, sorry, I talked with my hands too much here, uh, and, and allows the, um, uh, the grain to be kept whole and, and not to be exploded and to get really uh, unique flavors and colors uh, by doing that process. Uh, so the malting is a very important part of the process uh, in doing that. But then we need to get the sugars and the proteins from those grains into our liquid. And so that's the beginning process of the brewing. Uh, the first step is to crack that grain. And I discovered uh, on our last brewing at, uh, brewing at Colonial Williamsburg just how important that cracking process is. Uh, I had ordered my grain to be ground, uh, as I order from a company out in the Midwest who ships all the, uh, the grain here to me in, at Colonial Williamsburg for my brewings and somehow their order had got mixed up and they didn't crack my grain. And I did not realize it until I had put it into the hot water to mash. Uh, and the problem is if you don't expose the interior of the grain to the hot water, 
you're not going to get much sugar out of it. Uh, and so as I was going through this process, I realized very quickly that uh, we needed some additional help in this beer, so I ended up dumping some molasses in there. Uh, we were making a dark beer, uh, and that provided me with a lot of sugar. And, and that would have probably been a very common 18th century solution. In fact, probably the most common beer brewed in 18th century Virginia was brewed from molasses, not grain. Why well, go through all this trouble of malting and crushing and mashing and grinding when you take molasses, throw it in a pot of boiling water with some hops and a little bit of wheat bran, and in less than an hour, you'll have a batch of molasses beer. Uh, and that's exactly what most Virginians are doing, rather than going through this much more complicated and, and detailed process here. Uh, so we had to sort of try and save our, our porter there. I actually tasted it on Thursday when we uh, transferred it, or on uh, Tuesday when we transferred it, and it, it seemed okay. So uh, we may have made up for the lack of, of cracking of the grain by uh, cheating and pouring it. Uh, molasses. Now, 200 years ago, uh, if I was a brewer in England, I could be arrested for doing that uh, because I'm adulterating my beer with all beer must be made from malt. Uh, and by adding sugar into it, I'm cheating the taxman because I haven't paid my malt tax. If you're in, a brewer in England, you actually are really heavily taxed. You pay a tax on hops, you pay a tax on malt, you pay a tax on fuel, and you pay a tax on your finished product. Uh, at one point, in the English Empire made almost a third of its income from beer taxes of various types. Uh, so this is a very important generator of income for the crown uh, over in England. And uh, we'll get into that a little more as we start to see some of the technology that comes in uh, that helps them to, to get a better understanding of how to tax all this stuff. But you crack that grain, you put it into the hot water, and you stir it all really very evenly and, and, and make sure there's no little dough balls or any of that. Uh, and you let it soak in that warm water. Uh, and, and this is one of the technology changes that really occurs in the 18th century that, that really speeds on the production of beer. And that's the invention of good quality, reasonably affordable glass thermometers, which allow you to get exact temperatures. And some of the first people to adopt using thermometers are brewers and distillers, because in both of those processes, the exact temperature is critical. If you're baking bread, it doesn't really matter if your oven's 425 or 400. Your bread's going to be done a little faster at 425, but it's not a huge difference. Whereas if you're making beer, that 25 degrees makes a huge difference in terms of the strength and the, the kind of extract. Uh, from the, uh, the enzymes you're going to get. Uh, so the mash is mixed and then allowed to sit. Uh, often it'll be, uh, uh, well, we'll go through the entire process. And then the, the mashing uh, is going to be separated out the grain from the liquid. There are lots of ways to do this 200 years ago. Uh, the one on the uh, left here uh, is, is an option I saw in an English brew house from the 18th century. It's a little hard to tell in this picture, but uh, inside of that wooden square there are lots and lots of tiny little holes drilled. On the other side, in the inside of that wooden square, is the tap for this tub. So that is acting as a shield to keep the grain from coming through the tap uh, and only allowing the, the liquid through those little holes that are drilled in. The other one is what's known as a wilch. And a wilch is, is almost a basket weave of, of straws that are wrapped around the tap as it's inside the tub and act to create a, a barrier and, and keep that grain from being sucked through with the liquid. Uh, we use an even simpler method, uh, a gravity-fed method uh, here uh, in this situation by um, having a strainer tub there on the bottom is our strainer. Uh, and that will uh, separate out the grain from the liquid. Oops, we're not getting it. Oh, as a matter of fact, you will get us to see a demonstration of that right now. So our top tub in this situation is a mash tub. Breweries are generally going to take advantage of gravity. 
it's a very important ally in this process. Otherwise, you got to carry lots of heavy buckets of wet grain and water and uh, all that sort of stuff up and down places that you may not need to. So uh, as our mash drains from the mash tub uh, through the strainer into a, a second mash tub, we are separating out, leaving that grain through that brass screen and the, getting the liquid is all we really want in this. That liquid is impregnated with the color of the malt that we used, as well as the sugars. And it's actually sticky, sweet, uh, and, and very surprisingly how sweet that grain can make that liquid. Uh, because we don't really think of grain as being sweet, but after that malting process, it really converts everything over to sugar for protein. When you get down to the bottom, what we'll then do is, is basically ladle out uh, with pans uh, the remaining uh, stuff into the, uh, um, we call it a hop back, but it's also a, grain, a malt back, uh, and, and we'll be able to let that all drain out. Then we'll take that grain another time and repeat the process yet again. You can make it up to three different times using the same grain. Now, each time you add water to the same grain, you get back less sugar. So you'll end up with three different alcoholic drinks. The first, strong beer, mash for an hour, boil for an hour. Uh, the second one, you mashed for two hours uh, and you boiled for two hours. And then the third time to make the small beer, as it's called, you mash for three hours and boil for three hours. So if you're gonna actually make three batches of beer from the same pile of grain, you're gonna be there at least 16 hours uh, doing this process. Uh, and that's a pretty elaborate kind of, of, of day, uh, believe me. Uh, and especially considering most of this, uh, at, now at this point we're gonna then uh, go on and, and add our hops to that liquid and bring it up to boil. Uh, it'll boil for an hour if it's the first runnings, it'll boil for two hours if it's a table beer, and for three hours if it's a small beer. Uh, and that'll help to uh, get the flavor of the hops uh, into that. Hops are the flower cone of the female hop plant. It is a member of the nettles family, a very quick growing vine. Uh, they'll grow about 30 feet in the summer and they'll bring it up and, and they uh, produce these little flower cones at the end of the summer which have a very bitter flavor and sort of floral aroma, uh, which will flavor that beer for us. Then we have to take that wort and bring it all up to a boil. And you can see here how we do that at Columbia Williamsburg. Uh, that copper is a very important tool for the brewers uh, 200 years ago. And in fact, these, the single most expensive thing you need to pay for when you're opening a brewery, uh, a large copper kettle. Uh, bigger ones than this, this one's really only a 20 gallon kettle, so pretty small one overall. But larger ones are often set into brick uh, and they're going to be uh, very difficult to control because you have to have a fire underneath that set into the brick kettle. Uh, but you can't just pick it off and take it off the fire when it's getting ready to boil over. Uh, so what you have to be able to do is to put that fire under control to make sure that doesn't happen. Uh, and that can be very tricky. If you have a big fire going under an empty copper kettle, you will burn a hole in the bottom of it in no time flat. I have a friend, friend in England, who Mark uh, Meltonville, who's an English beer brewer and food historian, who's burned through seven kettles. And they are expensive. Uh, so that is something that is a very uh, tricky part of that process. Uh, After the boil, the hops are going to be removed. So we'll strain those back out through our, our hop uh, back, as it's called, uh, there as well. And then the liquid needs to be cooled down before you put the yeast in. Yeast does not like any temperature over 100 degrees. Uh, in fact, ale yeasts, the ones that we're using in this period, uh, really prefer the temperatures somewhere in the neighborhood of 60 to 70 Fahrenheit. The world is then cooled in a large flat lead lined container called a cool ship. Yes, lead is a cool metal in the 18th century, so it is used to cool liquids 
uh, oftentimes in this period. So the, the cool ship is off to the uh, right side of the picture there. And you, the beer runs down that ramp, and the fast, the wider you spread it out, the faster it cools. If you have a well-designed cool ship, you can go from boiling to about 70 degrees in about 40 to 45 minutes. So very quick, pretty quick cooling process. Uh, today, modern war chillers do it almost instantly, but you know that, that's that's a glycol technology that wasn't around 200 years ago. Uh, and so this, that's a pretty efficient system for cooling all that down. Uh, and if you're careful enough to clean that lead lining, uh, you should be okay. The lead really isn't going to be a problem with beer because most beers are not that acidic. Uh, it's acidic enough to let that, leach that out. The problem with lead was wine. Uh, because in the 18th century, they sweetened wine with powdered lead. Uh, powdered lead actually has a very sweet taste. That's why the kids always used to eat the lead paint. Uh, and they used it uh, in some cases as a sweetening ingredient uh, in wine. So you're, you're probably more likely to get lead poisoning from wine than beer to it. At that point, the yeast is added in. The yeast is in a liquid form. Uh, and it's going to be, and that's true when you bake with it as well. All the yeast is yeast to that. We do not have specialized strains of yeast that are used for baking and distilling and cider and mead and, and beer. It's all just yeast. Uh, and so when we make beer, we are also making the yeast uh, that we need in our household. In fact, when you make beer, you'll get about 10 times the yeast out of it that you put into it. So making beer is a great way of making yeast. And then that excess yeast you can use in your household. You can get it at two times. Initially, the beer is going to produce a big foam. You see the picture on, on the screen there. It has, uh, uh, it's almost all yeast. You can skim some of that off, put it in a bottle, uh, and use that to make your bread or, or your next batch of beer. Or you can wait till the beer finishes fermenting. That yeast will settle down to be a sludge on the bottom. Transfer the liquid off the sludge, take the sludge, uh, press some of the liquid out of it, and you can use that as well. Uh, and so there are a couple of ways you can get it. Uh, and there was a great deal of debate in 18th century uh, minds as to which was the better way to get your yeast. Uh, I found a wonderful quote from uh, a, a, a book called The New England Housewife Farmer, uh, where they talk about... Uh, you want the yeast on uh, the foam rather than the dr pernicious dregs, as she described it. Uh, so she thought that was a much healthier version. Uh, I'm just getting it from the top. The beer will then ferment for a couple weeks. When we do our brewing program at Colonial Williamsburg, I cannot tell you the number of guests who come in expecting a free sample. Uh, sorry folks, beer is not an instant product. It does take uh, at least uh, three weeks to ferment, if not a month, depending on the yeast strains and the type of beer and how strong it is in the weather and uh, various other factors. But uh, it's going to have to go for a little while. And in some cases, beers in the 18th century, in particular porter, uh, was aged up to two years before being drunk. The porter brewers would age some of their porter in big, huge barrels for two years, and then they would blend that aged beer, two-thirds uh, fresh beer to one-third stale, as they called it, uh, to make the, the exact flavor uh, that they were looking for in their product. After the fermentation process is over, you can either bottle or keg your beer. If you keep your beer in a wooden keg, it will not last as long as if you bottle it. Wooden kegs are porous. They allow air in, which will eventually spoil beer. Beer's biggest enemy are air and light. So anything you can do to keep those things away from your beer, the longer your beer is going to last. Uh, so it's better to put it in a glass bottle, but you have to pay for glass bottles. And you have to pay for corks to seal those glass bottles. And this seemed to be a particular problem for Mr. Jefferson. Uh, he has a great deal of correspondence dedicated to getting corks uh, for preserving his beer uh, in this period. And, and, and it's, there's another advantage to bottling beer over cask beer. And that is when you bottle the beer, you can add in each bottle a little lump of sugar. This will cause another fermentation inside the bottle and will carbonate your beer. 
If you get beer from a wooden keg 200 years ago, it's going to be very flat because a keg cannot handle the pressure necessary to carbonate beer. So the other advantage to drinking bottled beer is that it's foamy, uh, which is one of the things, of course, everybody likes about beer, right? So um, Jefferson is, is definitely a bottler of his beer, and, and like I say, spent a great deal of time getting, uh, trying to get corks. As he says, it's so provoking to lose good liquor to buy bad corks. <laughs> Great name, for, uh, great uh, motto for a court company, I guess. <laughs> and he actually, while Miller is down in Norfolk, uh, trying to get settled uh, there, he uh, asks him to send him bottles and corks. Uh, and Miller does this on a number of occasions throughout the years. So let's look a little bit at the people involved in, in brewing uh, at Monticello. Traditionally, most brewers were housewives. Mom. Mom is the beer brewer because mom is making the yeast that she's going to do to make her bread. Uh, and so she's also going to make beer. And beer was, was a cottage industry uh, throughout the, uh, the early days in England and up into the 18th century. Uh, and even in colonial Virginia, there were a lot of women house brewers who were brewing that last beer at home. Uh, when we look at the inventories in James City County around the city of Williamsburg, uh, we find about 40 people who have hops in their inventory, and almost none of them have malt, but they all have molasses. And the exact same thing happens at the governor's palace. You look at the inventory of Governor Bonita, uh He has half a barrel of molasses and half a barrel of molasses beer. Uh, he has a big pile of hops, but he has no malt. Uh, and one of the first entries uh, of the butler, Mr. Marshman, for the governor is hops and yeast for brewing. Doesn't mention malt, just hops and yeast for brewing. So that's a pretty good indication that they're making molasses beer. Now that is not going to the governor's table. That would be going for the servants. As a paid English servant, and Governor Bonitat bought 12 servants with him to the palace, uh, you expected a beer allowance. It's part of your payment. Uh, so uh, that beer was more than likely being brewed to feed uh, the, the beer allowance of his paid servants from home. So most brewers were mom. And, and that's true throughout history. Ancient Sumeria, ancient Egypt, uh, on up to the 18th century, women are often the primary brewers. Uh, and it's and a very interesting thing happens in the end of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century as beer brewing industrializes, is it switches sexes in an extremely dramatic way. Uh, now, women brewers are fairly hard to find. Uh, there's, in fact, a, a, a group called the Pink Boots Society dedicated to getting more women brewers in the craft brewing industry in America today uh, because they're just not, you know, if, if you go to a home brew conference, let me tell you, it's all guys. <laughs> very, very, very male-dominated uh, kind of preference. But yeah, and that's, as I say, as, as it begins to go from being done at home by mom to being done in a factory by men, uh, it becomes a professional trade. And it's only wealthy men who can afford to spend all the money on all these coppers and barrels and various equipments and things that are needed to run a larger scale uh, commercial brewing. And it really transitions uh, from being women's work to being men's work, as I said earlier, and, and it's really, a, a very pretty dramatic changeover as, as we industrialize. Technology also helps with some of that as well as the thermometer I mentioned earlier uh, comes in and, and another device that's created in the 18th century that's very important in brewing is called the sacrometer. Today we know this device is a hydrometer and it allows you to measure the amount of, of sugar in suspension in a lecture uh, if you do that before you put in your yeast and you do it after you put in your yeast and it's finished fermenting, you can tell exactly how much alcohol your beer has. 
up until 1770s, no one knew how much alcohol was in their beer. Uh, but now we can know exactly, and the British government and the American government can base their beer taxes on that strength uh, very clearly. And so very important in helping to industrialize uh, the process as well. So we're starting to get a real production in, in England, especially with industrialization. The top 10 porter brewers in London are brewing over 375,000 barrels of beer a year. That's a lot of beer. Uh, and it's being shipped all over the planet. Catherine the Great in Russia is a huge fan of English porter. Uh, the English officers in India wouldn't have made it without their English uh, pale ale, or West India pale ale, as it was called before it became known as IPA. Uh, there's actually, in fact, three times as much porter sent to India than pale ale. But the porter went to the soldiers and the pale ale went to the enlisted, to the officers. Uh, and so you see who has the better press there. So and brewing is really taking off in England. But here in America, we're, we're a little behind the times. We're, we're farmers. Uh, we're not doing quite as much industrializing. And, and whatnot. So uh, our brewing revolution is really going to come in the 1830s with the help of some Germans who come over with a new style of yeast called lager yeast, the German word for store. To lager is to store in Germany. Uh, and that's a yeast that works at a very low temperature, very slowly, and produces a very clean flavored beer. And, and that's what makes American beer today. Budweiser, Miller, all those beers are all lager style beers using that new German yeast that comes in the 1830s. So in this period, brewing is still a skill passed from one man to another, uh, basically, or in this case, between uh, Miller and Hemmings, uh, Peter Hemmings uh, at Monticello. And, and it seems that there were two, the, the, the records aren't entirely clear, but it looks like there were two occasions where Miller came and, and talked um, Hemings, the, the brewing process, uh, but it didn't take him long uh, to catch on. Now, a little bit about Miller, uh, as, as Punky started off with a little bit of his story, he was actually born here in America, uh, but his mother and he soon returned to England where he was raised and became ship's captain and worked at a brewery and, and then came back right at the verge of the uh, uh, War of 1812. Uh, he apparently had also been offered some property here, or his brother here had some property uh, that he brought him to Almaro as well uh, early on. And, and eventually he ends up having uh, Jefferson uh, sort of asking uh, in his defense uh, and, and offering, uh, sending letters to folks in Norfolk to allow him to travel down there to settle some of his claims and estates. Uh, for his brother's estate there in Norfolk. And also he wanted to um, uh, eventually open a brewery. Uh, he became viewed as having Jefferson's protection, which probably was fine from Mr. Miller's point of view, uh, as he was under somewhat some suspicion leading an Englishman newly arrived here in America at the height of the war, at the beginning of the war. He also gets corks and bottles for uh, Jefferson, as we mentioned earlier, on a number of occasions. Uh, he also has agents in Richmond who buy corks and bottles for him, uh, and some of his neighbors who help him out occasionally uh, by offering to get those for him as well. So that constant search. Sometime, we think, in the fall of 1815 is when Miller first stays at Monticello uh, to train Hemmings in, in brewing. Peter is kind of an interesting subject on his own. Uh, we'll get to him in a minute. Uh, but we do know, as, as I mentioned earlier, that, that Miller wanted to open up a brewery uh, in Norfolk. Uh, and, and Jefferson gives him a, a little push in that direction. An honest and useful man who's about to establish in this country a brewery, which I think him a skillful man as who has ever come to this country. Uh, so he, he's trying to push him up and sell him off uh, to, uh, to help him out there in, in Norfolk as well. But really, the, the person probably most responsible doing the majority of the work and, and learning the skill the most important way uh, was 
fact, Jefferson's servant, uh, Peter Hemings. 18th century Virginians have a habit of referring to their enslaved people as servants. There are probably a number of reasons for this, uh, but it is a very common thing to do in this uh, period, uh, and, and this is no exception. Uh, it, it's sort of an interesting uh, dichotomy of what's going on in, in Jefferson's mind and his whole issues with slavery uh, during this period. Uh, he certainly, on a number of occasions, talks about the skill, intelligence, and capabilities of, of James uh, and his ability to do all this sort of thing. Uh, and, and often bra and brags about it to his neighbor, who he offers to have Hemings teach one of his servants the skills of brewing as well, Mr. Berber. Uh, so he, he's frequently mentioning this, yet he's keeping him enslaved. Uh, and in fact, for Hemings, it's, it's an even more interesting uh, situation because you know Jefferson is aware of all these conflicts. He describes uh, slavery is, is a bit like having a, a wolf by the ears because you, you can't let go uh, and, and it will be very difficult to hold on for long. He understood that, but he also understood the economic reality that Virginia was an enslaved society and that there was no economy here without slavery. So it, it, it's a very interesting uh, situation. But in, in this case, all, both free and enslaved people, are, are working together uh, to, to bring that to uh, the thing. And, I, and although we tend to think of, of Jefferson as more of the beer drinker or the wine drinker, uh, he was also very interested in beer. Uh, back to, to Peter, just briefly. Uh, Peter was probably started off his, his working with Jefferson in the kitchen. We think that it is likely that it's him that his brother James, who went to with Jefferson to France, when, when James and, and Sally were in France, they were technically free. Uh, the French did not have slavery in France itself, although they certainly practiced it in their colonies. Uh, they did not have it in, in France itself. And, and there was an agreement made that, that James would learn the arts of French cookery, go back to Monticello as an enslaved person, and teach that to someone here, and then would be given his freedom. And, and this does eventually happen uh, for James. Uh, but, but it's his brother that he's teaching uh, the skill to. Could you imagine being put in that situation where you will get your freedom only if you make sure that your brother does not? Uh, so sort of a, a, a very difficult mental kind of a, a, a thing to go through. Uh, but uh, James ends up uh, uh, in Philadelphia for a little while and, and then it's believed that he committed suicide. So he, he was not able to adjust to the freedom and, and find a, a, a successful living uh, as a cook on his own. And, and, and often that's the case. Uh, people are, are, are in Virginia aren't hiring a lot of cooks or brewers uh, in this period uh, because they have enslaved people with those skills. Why spend money on somebody else to do it when you have enslaved people who will do it for free or for, for part of their existence? Jefferson here is also echoing a uh, very common sort of a uh, viewpoint in the 18th century related to alcohol. There's a, a break in thinking about alcohol. Alcohol, uh, the stilled spirits are viewed as dangerous things. Fermented beverages are viewed as healthy things. Probably the biggest proponent of this sort of theory is Dr. Benjamin Rush. Philadelphia physician. He comes up with a wonderful, I, I, I don't know why I didn't put this in, I didn't think about it until today, uh, but um, it comes up with a moral and physical thermometer of temperance. And uh, so it's, think of a thermometer, and on one side is the beverage, and on the other side is the effect. And so up at the top of the healthy region, you have water and small beer. And on the other side, you have healthy, long life. Down at the bottom, you have whis whiskey, and you have on the other side, madness and death. Uh, and, and so you see this, this attitude that distilled spirits are, are dangerous things, 
Uh, but but fermented beverages are natural and healthy and nutritious. Uh, but but when you start distilling it, it becomes uh, a problem, and, and that's a change because originally distilled spirits were viewed as as super medicine, aquaviti, as they were known, water of life. They're supposed to cure everything. And in fact, if you look at an 18th century cookbook, you will frequently see Mrs. So and So's water for gout, Mr. So and So's water for this. this is, so there are various distilled beverages that are thought of as medicines. And let's face it, even today, alcohol is a very common medicine and certain, uh, or a very common addition in certain medicines, cough medicines and so forth. Um, uh, so yeah, there's that interesting uh, dichotomy of, of distilled spirits versus fermented. I, I think it was the Archbishop of Canterbury in 1770, or 1734, who put it best. He says, strong drink inflates in every man a high opinion of his own self-worth. <laughs> Blows the latent flames of pride and sets every man on equal with his master. So that's why tonight you're only getting beer and wine. Uh, I, I, I kid, but uh, that is the, the, the attitude that sort of develops towards the end of the 18th century. It's, it's kind of funny because America begins going in the exact opposite direction. As, as young farmers up in the mountains of Virginia, we start to grow lots and lots of corn. And what's the best way to keep your corn forever? Turn it into bourbon. Uh, and that's exactly what everybody in the mountains of Virginia starts doing, right? There's still some people around the mountains of Virginia doing that. Uh, they just forget to pay their taxes. <laughs> it's been a problem all along. Uh, and, and certainly uh, it was an issue then. But uh, by the 1820s, Americans are consuming huge quantities of distilled spirits. And this was something Jefferson saw and, and was upset about. Uh, and, and so wanted to, to promote fermented beverages over the still. So we're pretty much winding down towards the end of our talk of Mr. Jefferson and brewing at Monticello. But I wanted to bring you guys a, a little bit of, of 18th century beer and brewing uh, and, and talk a little bit about that. And, and I also just want to talk briefly a little bit about the, the meal. I was able to talk with your chef here uh, for a little while and, and to talk about getting some 18th century foods and uh, 18th century style beverages for, for our dinner this evening. And, and I think we came across a very good uh, uh, process of that. We have a number of recipes up on our website at Colonial Williamsburg uh, that we've translated from 18th century cookbooks. Uh, and he selected some wonderful uh, ones from that. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to the dinner portion of all this as well. Uh, but let me see what I didn't cover for you folks. What questions do you all have about beer and brewing and Monticello and all that? Yes, Wayne. Hops. Hops. Where do they come from? Where are they grown here? Where they the, the hop is first used in brewing in Germany in about 800, 880. Um, is when you start to first see them in brewing. The hop goes from Germany to Holland, Holland to England, England to America. As early as 1621, we are planting English hops in America. But the plant already exists here in a native form. And pretty soon thereafter, people start to crossbreed European and American hops together. And in fact, one of the most famous varieties of hops in early America is something called cluster hop. And that is a cross between a wild American father and a European mother. And it was a big hop in New York State. New York State grew lots of hops up until about 1840 uh, when a blight called powdery mildew came and wiped it out. Another question? Right here. Excuse me, one quick point about hops is most of the time they seem to be grown by enslaved people. Almost always they're paying uh, enslaved folks for the hops. And if you think about tobacco and how it works, it makes sense. Tobacco is planted in May, early in the spring, or February even in some cases, and harvested in November. <coughs> the hops are twined around a vine early in the spring and harvested in September. So you can get them in and out of, in between the crop of tobacco. Uh, and that would allow the enslaved folks, and they're really not a lot of work. The plant just twines up the vine. Uh, so you know, you set, set it on a pole and it goes. I'm sorry, she didn't go. Yeah. 
second seat. Uh, somebody's coming with a microphone for you. That will help out. Thank you. I wanted to thank you for your great talk and also to say that there's another point that I think um, I know that your talk begins in 1810, after 1810, but to underscore your point about the involvement of women um, in brewing, at Monticello, it was Jefferson's wife, Martha Wales Skelton Jefferson, who's the first brewer, and they married in 1772. She dies in 1782 but she's known for um, brewing beer. And it's something that she actually did, unlike Jefferson, who wasn't actually brewing the beer. She was brewing sm what we take with, as small beer. And she no doubt was assisted by an enslaved woman named Ursula Granger, who was a cook, who was a like notable cook and the first uh, cook at Monticello was Ursula, but she surely must have helped Martha in her beer making. Absolutely. We have one more question. Over there. Oh, oh, we got a lot of questions. Frank, you're going to have to stay, <laughs> but we'll, we'll give, uh, where's Bruce? Yeah. I think one thing to consider uh, was the quality of water that all of these people had and uh, for a, um, a beverage, uh, it was much nicer to have a beer than a water. Yeah, it, uh, it's, it's a lot more fun. Um, yeah, you know, that's one of those, those things that, that we, we hear a lot, but, but it's a little more complicated than that in the 18th century. For them, it's not the safety of water, it's the nutritional value of beer. Beer is healthy and nutritious because it's full of calories. You don't get a gut like this drinking water. Uh, you know, so that, that's why you drink beer, is that beer is, is, is strong and fortifying. It's liquid bread. It's, it's a calorie intake. And that's what's healthier about it more so than, than the, the water issues. The other advantage that people understood was that brewers know where to get good water because good water is very important to making good beer. So they're going to be using spring water, not like well water in, in cities, you know. And, and so, yeah, they, they're much more careful about that. And so you let the brewer pick the water and make it better by turning it into grain. Oh, well, Mr. Jefferson. We, we ought to let Mr. Jefferson put in his two, two very quick questions, Frank. Firstly, you, you had mentioned uh, the, the mysteries of brewing. Was, was there, is there a guild of brewers in London? There was, yes. There, was a guild? there absolutely was in the 18th century. It doesn't make it to America, but pretty early on after we started industrializing, we start to do the same sort of thing. Master Brewers Association and people like that, which are some of them are still around today, uh, that, that, that regulate the trade and also educate people in the trade and that sort of thing. Sure. And when beer was exported from England, was it uh, exported mostly in bottles or in barrels? You know, it's, it's, there's, I'm surprised by how many barrels full of bottles are sent out of England uh, because it's, it's a particularly inefficient way of doing it. You have to have a lot of straw in there wrapping those barrels so that you know the, when the bottles or barrels are rolled, uh, the bottles don't break, uh, and you can get a whole lot more beer in a barrel just as a barrel than you can as a bottle. But I do regularly see barrels full of bottled beer being shipped from England. And uh, so uh, it, it would seem to me to make a lot more sense to ship the beer in the barrel uh, and then bottle it here. And you do see that, I think, with taverns. If you look at the inventory of many of the Williamsburg taverns, down in the cellar are empty carboys, big glass containers uh, for holding liquid, and empty bottles and, and empty barrels. And that tells me that someone's brought in a, a, car, a, a barrel from England and then bottled it. The tavern has to sell their beverage in a measured quantity. It has to be in a measure approved class. Yeah. Could, could you comment on the significance of 
a beer like Guinness being shipped all the way from Ireland to India in the months it spent at sea and why it survived and none of the other beers did. Well, it, it, one of the things about that is that they're going to, they understood one basic thing about beer chemistry, and that is the hops help prevent spoiling infections from occurring in your beer. And the more hops you put in a beer, the more it helps prevent spoiling infections. Also, the more alcohol you put in a beer, the more that helps to prevent certain spoiling infections. So they would actually alter the recipe depending on where the beer was going and when it was going to be consumed. So if you're a London brewer who's making beer for the Virginia market, you're going to put a certain amount of hops in. If you then start making beer for Jamaica, you're going to put more than Virginia. Jamaica's further away, it's a hotter climate. So once the beer gets there, it's got to survive. If you're going for India, you're going to put even more than Jamaica. So they designed these beers for transportation by adding lots and lots of hops to them. But there's something about a sea journey in a wooden barrel that seems to improve not only beer, but also wine. Madeira and port wines, especially, you're going to be having uh, some of that with dinner to this evening, uh, were, are, are actually improved by being rocked gently there. The yeast is being mixed up, sediment is being stirred in uh, on these journeys, uh, and, and they're slowly oxidizing along the way. And so there, there, there is some uh, improvement, uh, they say, in the quality and the, the flavor of these beverages uh, through transporting them on, on sea journeys. Well, it seems like we need. Well, it seems like we need a seminar on beer. So maybe Frank Clark can come back again and share and have a chat. Sure, love to. Absolutely.